Uh, when Ryan first contacted me, he said, yeah, could you talk to this Ephesians 3 group we've got? <laughs> Your topic is Jesus. You've got 10 minutes. <laughs> okay, okay. So here we are. Um, I'm not from Columbia. I'm not an alum of Mizzou. I'm here on campus this week. What a week to be here on campus. What a week to talk about the person of Jesus, right? The second person of the Trinity. I think we might need a little bit of it right now. I think you might need a little bit of it right now. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this in a, in a particular way. Okay? If you want to know what the creed says about the person of Jesus Christ, God the Son, listen on Sundays. We're going to do a little bit of that today. If you want to know what it actually means, go to the Catechism. It spends 1,200 pages explaining it in a very clear way. What I'd like to do with you tonight is kind of take apart a few elements of what we say in the creed to talk about the so what element. So we've got God. As Christians, God the Son is what distinguishes us. God the Father is what we share in common with our Jewish brothers and sisters. God the Son, the Son being God in Jesus Christ, is what distinguishes us as Christian people. So he's kind of a big deal. And we better know what we're talking about when we actually talk about the creed. So I'm hoping we actually have the words of the creed. There we go. Let's just say that loud, all right? You say this every Sunday. So this is just a cheat sheet. If you think you're really good and you want to brag a little, close your eyes. Ready? What do we say every single Sunday? What do we believe? Go. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only God, Son of God. Stop. What is the God? <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought. Keep going. <laughs> What's the point? <laughs> That's kind of poetic, isn't it? It's, we've already said God is God. Light from light. True God from true God. Didn't we just say that? These lines, God from God, light from light, true God from true God. These are what it means to say Jesus was not a really nice guy. <laughs> Jesus was not a healer. Jesus was not a preacher. Jesus was not a miracle worker who lived in Nazareth. Nazareth in the first century as a Palestinian Jew. Jesus was the Son of God. Jesus is the incarnation of the second person of the Trinity. You want a Catholic stumper? Try this one. I'm not going to give you the answer. That's why I was a stumper. What was the second person of the Trinity before the incarnation? <laughs> Think about it. What was the second person of the Trinity before the person of Jesus Christ? Because it existed. Here's kind of your answer. It was God. It was light. It was true God. In the beginning was the Oh. And the Word was made Oh. The Word of God. I just gave you the answer. I didn't tell you what. God from God, light from light, true God from true God. There it is again. Keep going. God not made. Okay, stop. <laughs> Begotten, not made. He was not created. God the Father is the creator. You talked about that last week, I'm thinking. Jesus was not created from God the Father. God the Son was begotten. Next part tells you what that means. Go ahead. Unsubstantial with the Father. Yep. Did you hear what, um, it wasn't Stephen, uh, yeah, Stephen Colbert said when we changed the words, when we retranslated this about consubstantial? He said, why do we have to change that word? Consubstantial. Isn't, wasn't, that's a, that's a word we don't even need in there. Don't they realize we renamed it Istanbul? <laughs> okay. <laughs> consubstantial with the Father. It means, it's this, he, Jesus is the same stuff. God the Son and God the Father are the same stuff. I don't know why we didn't translate it into same stuff. I mean, it would have made more sense. Consubstantial with the Father. Keep going. Through him all things are made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. Stop. <laughs> I don't know how to finish it. I don't. For us and for 
our salvation, he came down from heaven. Now here's, here's a question. Why? <coughs> Why? He could have saved us from heaven. Could he? He's dead. Why? This is the whole point of tonight. This is what I'm going to take up my entire ten minutes. All the rest was just a preview. I'm not counting that. Now, <laughs> ten minutes right now. <laughs> Why did he come down from heaven to save us? Ryan, is that a hand up? I love it. No, you're good. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Did you ever hear of a saint called Saint Athanasius? Uh, somebody say yes. yes. Okay, good. Saint Athanasius. One of the things he said, and I quote, God became man so that man might become God. Why did God incarnate? That's the word we use came down from heaven by the power of the Holy Spirit, was incarnate of the Virgin Mary, and became human. He became a man. God became human so that we can become God. If you think about this, this God that created the entire universe, multiverse, the Milky Way, the giraffe and the ladybug, you and the weird person sitting next to you, yeah, he made her. <laughs> And he made him too. This God who created everything, this God, the creator of the universe, took on this stuff. He, he came to be born as a human person to a teeny, tiny, little God-forsaken town in the first century to a young girl who we don't think was more than 15 years old who owned Nothing, who had no power, who had no status, who had a fiance who was about to find out something very disappointing. <laughs> Why? So that we would understand how loved we are. God came to us on our own terms. Because all through the Old Testament story, we have an entire Old Testament story that tells us how much God loves us. And God gave us everything he could think of to prove his love for us. He gave us fathers. He gave us prophets. He gave us priests. He gave us kings. He gave us all kinds of things. Still didn't convince us. What would convince you? God scratched his proverbial head. Let me become one of them. Let me become human. So that they can understand my love in the form of a human love. And then they'll never question it again. Right? Right, because we never question God's love. Yeah. Ever. Right? God became human. We have God the Son in the person of Jesus Christ. Otherwise known as the incarnation. The incarnation. Do I have anybody who knows Latin? Oh, shoot. Harness. Help me. Fada, help me. Flesh. Flesh. In the flesh, the act of. So the incarnation is the act of coming into the flesh. That's the incarnation. It's when Jesus became human at the Annunciation to Mary. If he becomes human so that we can become God, well then we got to take that seriously. And here's where I'm going to go off creed for a minute. If God... God, the eternal God, takes on human flesh, takes on a human body, and he is named by his mother, Jesus. Then what does that little person running around, or toddling around, or crawling around, what is he crawling around in? This is not a trick question. What are you, what are you crawling around in when you're crawling around? Well, not on the ground. What, what are you literally using to crawl around? <coughs> yeah, or what do we, you don't typically say your flesh. This is your, <laughs> your body. <laughs> 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 <It's hard. laughs> so this little thing toddling around is the body of? Christ. It's the body of Christ. He was a very real human person. But we use that term, body of Christ, a lot. What else do we use it to refer to? The church. The building? I don't think so. The church meaning you and you 
and you and me, and you and you and you and everybody else in this room. We are the body of Christ. We are one body. Don't do it. We are the body of Christ. What else do we use body of Christ to refer to? The Eucharist. So when we receive the Eucharist, how do we become the body of Christ? We are the body of Christ. We become what we consume. We become what you consume. Thomas Aquinas, very good. Receive what you already are. Now here's the story part. Here's the last of my ten minutes. If we're going to be the body of Christ, what does that actually mean? Years ago, there used to be this thing called uh, the Missouri Association of Catholic College Students. It's called MACS, M-A-C-C-S. And they did a retreat every year. And one year, I was doing this retreat, talking about the Sacred Heart, and there was this kid, that kid, this very mature college student, <laughs> out in the group. And we were, I was talking about this notion of incarnation and becoming the body of Christ. And I said, have you ever had an experience of this? And this guy, I'll never forget this guy. He was hilarious. He had an afro <laughs> at least 16 inches high. I don't know how he kept his pants up because he had no belt and it was like riding right there. It, he looked like he was straight out of the 70s. But this was like 2003 or so. This was not the 70s. And he said, I got a story. So this is his story, but I'm going to tell it as if I were he. His name is Jake. And he said, you know, I like going to church. I really like going to church. But when I go home to my parish church, they don't really get me. <laughs> and he said, I like to sit up in the front benches, and I'm never really there on time. So sometimes I come in during the Gloria, and sometimes I come in during the first reading, and sometimes I come in when the priest is talking. But I always go down to the front pews, and there's this little old lady in my parish. And I don't know if I'm sitting in her pew, or she just doesn't like me, or what, because every time I sit down, this is what I hear. <laughs> <laughs> so either she has some kind of respiratory problem, or I think it's about me. And then I look on the other side of the aisle, and there's Mr. Festus, or Mr. Whoever, who you know, like when I was a kid, my brother and I would always hit our baseballs in his yard, and he would wait until he saw the baseball come in his yard, and then he'd run out, and he'd grab it, and he'd run back inside. <laughs> so we hated that guy. <laughs> we hated that guy. And then I'd look, and I'd see my third grade teacher, three rows back, who told me I'd never be any good at math. And she was right, but that's kind of the nice thing to say. <laughs> because when it's time for communion, I go up, and when the priest holds the Eucharist in front of me, and he says, the body of Christ, I say with all my heart and soul, amen, yes, I believe that, I need that, I want that, I believe that. And then I receive it and I go back to my bench. And then, as each person in that church comes up to receive communion, I want to be able to hear the priest say the body of Christ to them and hold it up in front of them. And I want to be able to look at that person, that little old lady who I annoy so much, Mr. Peterson, who used to keep, keep my base up, my third grade teacher, who told me I would never amount to anything. I want to hear him say to them, the body of Christ. And I want to say about them, amen. <coughs> You are the body of Christ. I've never been so inspired by an understanding of the Eucharist and an understanding of what it means to be the body of Christ and why the Son of God decided to become incarnate like us. And I got from that, that young man. This is who we are supposed to be. And ladies and gentlemen, in case you hadn't noticed, the body of Christ is broken. Had you noticed that? Even in the Eucharist, four elements to the consecration. It is taken, it is blessed, it is broken, it is shared. 
in our lives, if we are the body of Christ, we will be taken up. We will be blessed. We will be broken. And that brokenness is so that we will be shared. So tonight, as you ponder the creed, and you ponder what it means to call the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who I can know personally, here's the question for you. What difference did the incarnation make? What difference does it make that God decided to become a human person? Does the incarnation require anything of you? Hint, hint, the answer is yes. If we are supposed to be the body of Christ, that is going to make a demand on us. What is that demand? This is for you to talk about. And secondly, right now, right here, in this time, in this space, in this city, in this school, in this room, what does the broken, what does the body of Christ look like? What is that broken heart of Christ looking like right now? I'm, I'm thinking we're seeing it all around campus. Yes? Yeah. And if we can start to recognize some of the speech, some of the, the hmm, some of the behaviors, some of the actions as a broken body, then we can respond not with making it more broken, but with doing a little bit to try to fix, heal, soothe some of that brokenness. Because we are the body of Christ. Where one is broken, all are broken. And we are not called to break some more, we are called for us and for our salvation to become incarnate and become more human. Please, remember that Jesus the Son is a human person. Therefore, if we are going to be called Christians and follow this guy, it will not be an easy path. Take a look at where he ended up. Take a good heart look. Look, 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 look. Let's see, I got it. <coughs> Brokenness is not something to be gone headlong and skipping and cheering, of course. But it's also not something to be feared. <laughs> because we know, we profess, every time we profess the creed, that brokenness leads to redemption. And that after the crucifixion comes the resurrection. This is our faith. And this is what we believe. And I think that was a little more than 10 minutes, but sorry.